really looking at the process of fertilization. But I'll also touch on the art of art, and by art, that is my field, the latter art of assisted reproductive techniques. And that is really how clinicians, scientists, and embryologists are, in quite ingenious way, um, overcoming dysfunction and dysregulation in the male and female body and reproductive system in couples who desire a child but are unable to conceive. And I thought, um, by way of introduction, just to remind you, I, mean, I think many of you will know this, this very beautiful picture from Botticelli, and it shows how a goddess is born. Um, and it shows the birth of Aphrodite. It was painted 1486. It's in Florence. And according to Greek mythology, Aphrodite was born from the foam, Aphras, the sea, from the foam of the sea. And the foam came about because um, Cronus, who was one of the gods, castrated the father of all gods, who was Uranus, and threw his genitals into the sea. And so the sea started to foam, and this goddess was born of, of beauty and of love. And um, I would suggest that human reproduction um, and some of the pictures we look at are similarly beautiful, but luckily a little bit less violent than um, the birth of gods. So the purpose of reproduction is really to propaga propagate and to ensure that the genetic information we all get carry is diversified and handed over to the progeny. Now there are many, many key steps in the process of um, human reproduction resulting in the birth of a, of a live baby. But one of the key steps is the development of the male and female germ cell, the sperm and the oocyte, and to make sure that they only carry half of the genetic information as a, every other cell. And you, you will remember that from um, school time and some of you obviously in the medical field. So the development of the haploid, haploid oocyte and the haploid sperm cell with 23 chromosomes and for the sperm being either X or Y. And there are many similarities in this process of the development of the germ cells, but there are some profound differences. And one of the big differences is really the difference in numbers. Um, and if we think about it, as far as the female reproductive system, it really is the question of the power of one. So the, the whole ovarian cycle and the process of ovulation it centers around the development of a single oocyte in what we call one dominant follicle. And at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, through the reproductive hormones, actually a number of follicles are recruited in the ovary from the pool of the resting follicles with which women are born, about 10 million at birth. And then there's one single follicle emerges as becoming dominant, and we can see that on the ultrasound, and we do much of that in infertility to look how these follicles are growing and when the single dominant follicle starts emerging. And this follicle achieves dominance by getting more and more receptors for the hormones which stimulate its growth, because the hormones go up and then they come down. And as they come down, having more and more receptors, this follicle is able to continue growing in a more scarce environment, so to speak, whereas other follicles, which are a little bit smaller, don't have all these receptors. And at the same time, it also actually um, produces substances which pre prevent other follicles from growing. So there's a suppression of other follicles. And really, the purpose is to bring forward one single life birth, because for human reproduction, we know that that is the safest way of reproduction for mother and for child. So could, can you just explain that? So what you see here is an ultrasound image, and Chantal knows much more about it than I do, but basically here you see an ovary. It's a transvaginal scan, and this here is the follicle, and the follicle is really a fluid bubble um, in which the oocyte is growing. So if you looked under the microscope, we would see maybe a little cluster here of cells which surround the growing egg. And at the time of ovulation, this follicle ruptures, and the oocyte is released. Sorry, how big is that? Is that like the normal size? How big is that? If you look on ultrasound and we measure the dominant follicle, which is pre-ovulatory, will be between 18 and 25 millimeters. Okay, so is that a zoomed image? Yeah. Those other ones are follicles. These are also little follicles, but they're not reaching dominance, and they will undergo cell death. And the majority of the oocytes in the ovary will undergo cell death. 
basically. And only very few will result in ovulation. And a minute percentage will obviously result in a live birth, in an actual baby. Now, as far as the male system is concerned, it's very different. Here we see the strategy is strength in numbers. Um, we do semen analysis very much as part of our workup of the infertile couple or subfertile couple. And here you see Lindy, one of our embryologists in the laboratory counting with her finger there. And we've got um, um, criteria set by the World Health Organization of what are the lower limits of a semen analysis, which we think is predictive of normal fertility. Um, we would like to have an ejaculate volume of 2.5 million. A count in every mill of the ejaculate should be 15 million. With a motility of the sperm of 30% and a normal morphology means a particular shape of the sperm under the microscope, what we call the perfectly shaped sperm, should be at least 4%. So there are millions of sperm versus the one oocyte. Um, and why do we need so many? Well, firstly, the sperm is there to maximize the chance of fertilization. The oocyte is there to maximize the chance of a singleton birth. And of all the sperm that are deposited at the time of intercourse in the reproductive system in the vagina, something like 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, at least three, maybe four noughts after the comma, percent of sperm actually reach the tube, which is where the sperm needs to go. And um, I think the other issue is that certainly in mammalian species, not all relationships are monogamous. And reproduction is very important for longevity and so having millions of sperm and having more sperm than another male is a possibility of ensuring your own progeny compared to another male competitor. Um, then just to touch on the actual process of fertilization, it occurs in the tube as you will recall and we have the oocyte here and the oocyte is protected by a zone, we call it the zona pellucida. And so the role of the sperm is first to attach to that zone and then move through that zone and attaches to species-specific receptors. The actual oocyte can actually be fertilized across species, but the zone is really protecting the oocyte and only species-specific sperm can penetrate that oocyte. Um, and here's a schematic drawing. Um, so you see here that outer layer of the egg. Um, which we call the zona pellucida. Then there's a little space, which we call the um, subvitelline um, space. And then there's the actual cover of the egg cell, which we call the um, vitelline membrane. And so what happens is that the zone, as it says, it needs to bind and then move through the zone, get into the perivitelline space. And then the first sperm that is able to penetrate the oocyte will induce what we call a cortical reaction. And that is a release, particularly of calcium, within the oocyte. And that basically blocks the oocyte from further fertilization. So the oocyte pulls up the chain bridge and other sperm can try to storm the citadel, but are no longer to get in. And so it prevents um, polyspermy um, and polyspermous fertilization. Generally speaking, sometimes things can go wrong. And then we can see the next day in the microscope, um, the fertilized egg with the two pronuclei. So we've got the male and female, I can't say which one. The male and female nucleus before they've actually joined. So each still with their 23 sets of chromosomes. And then these two nuclei will actually dissolve. The chromosomes will align themselves. There will be an exchange of the chromosomes and then we will go into the process of cell division and we now have either a 46XY or 46XX, what we call a zygote. Now when we do IVF, we want to have lots of those um, oocytes for fertilization because it improves the chance of success. Um, and in the case of a severe male factor, the sperm, either because of quantity or qualitative defects, is not able to either even reach the egg cell or is not able to penetrate the egg cell. So then one of our key interventions in infertility is what we call intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And many of you know, may know about it, but just to show you some pictures, what it means is that we actually inject 
the sperm into the egg cell. And so we've now obtained the egg cell through in vitro fertilization and an egg retrieval, which we do in theater through the vagina with a little needle. We puncture these follicles. We hopefully have many because we've given her fertility hormones. We aspirate the egg cell. And then our very skilled embryologist will, in the micro manipulator, which you see there on the side, have a holding pipette with a little bit of negative pressure stabilize the egg cell here you see that's a little bit sucked against the holding pupil take one sperm cell break of the tail because the tail has got no business in the egg cell it's just there to get to the egg cell and through the zona and then inject the egg cell straight into uh, the sperm cell straight into the oocyte and that really does result in fertilization and what we then can see in the IVF laboratory is a development of the early embryo. Up there you can see a six cell stage embryo which takes about two to, two to three days of development. And then as cells grow more and more we get another critical step which is called the blastocyst. And here on the blastocyst you can already see um, an outer layer of cells which later develop into the placenta, the afterbirth, and the membranes for the baby and the so-called inner cell mass from which the actual embryo will develop. Here we see a hatching blastocyst where the blastocyst actually escapes the zona pellucida which is initially still around that um, early zygote and embryo. And here you see wonderful Marlies in our laboratory looking at the embryos because she now has to decide we may have five or six of blastocysts which want to transfer. Oh, she's smiling. Oh, uh, because I'm taking the photograph. Oh, um, and she found the best embryo. So we now in the embryology in the IVF laboratory grade these embryos and we believe that form is function. So we have certain criteria of looking and we want to have a beautiful layer of cells around the blastocyst. We don't want granularity, we want regular cells. And so we have top graded blastocysts and they do carry the highest chance of success with regards to implantation but not always because we realize obviously form is only related to function to a certain degree and in the research arena we are now having other techniques which we are exploring into evaluating how well such an early embryo performs how healthy it is we people are looking at the culture medium around the embryos and looking at the metabolic footprint and interestingly, you want a footprint which is neither too big nor too small. You don't want a metabolically underactive embryo, but you also don't want an overactive embryo because that may be a damaged embryo who's having all kind of repair processes going on. We can also biopsy this blastocyst. Um, best biopsy to take is from the trophectoderm that is best tolerated, but you can biopsy the embryo. You can take any one of those cells and just go take it away because all these cells are omnipotent and can basically develop into all cell lines that are required for this baby to be. And you can do a genetic and assessment um, of the embryo. Um, and the third thing that is currently being done is that we only take the embryos out on day two, day three, day five to look at the pronucleus, the cleavage stage and the blastocyst development because we don't like to disturb them. So camera systems have been fitted into the incubators, so we now have time-lapse assessments of early human development to look exactly at when embryos are achieving their certain milestones and observing cell division. As yet, that hasn't really translated into better pregnancy rates following IVF, but the data is still re reasonably new. Um, and then the next step um, is implantation. In the normal physiology of events, the fertilized oocyte will reach the uterus round about day five, having spent the other five days of life in the tubes. And there's much interest in my field at the moment as to what makes the uterus receptive to implantation. And we know that there's an intense crosstalk between that embryo, which is bristling with receptors and hormones and cytokines and biochemical messages, and the same is happening at the endometrium. Um, a key hormone for receptivity is progesterone, which is produced by the remnants of the follicle after ovulation. And we know there's a window of implantation. 
which is a few days. And if you put in the embryo too early or too late, you'll definitely won't get a pregnancy. But we're trying to optimize that window of implantation. Now, when it comes to IVF, we're doing transthervical uterine transfers. This is one of our catheters, um, which, you, which is about two millimeters, very soft. We pass a speculum, we do an ultrasound again. And um, you can see here the full bladder of the patient. Um, here is the uterus. And you can see here our transfer catheter in which the embryologist will load one, maybe two fertilized eggs, blastocysts. And we advance the catheter into the mid area of the cavity of the uterus. We've got a little syringe attached at the end and we go through. And then put, basically put the fluid, a little bit of culture medium around the embryo is put into the intrauterine cavity. It's a transfer, it's not a transplant or an implant. And then the rest is over to nature. Again, there's much interest into what exactly happens and people take biopsies for the endometrium, obviously just before the embryo transfer to see what is the genetic profile, what genes are being expressed, what's the hormonal profile, metabolic profile, histological profile, so we can learn more about it. But we still know relatively little about the science of that aspect of reproduction and in vitro fertilization. Um, so to date, um, following the first birth of the IVF baby, which you all know, Louise Brown, um, about 5 million babies have been born worldwide. We are estimating that about 1.5 million IVF cycles are done each year, resulting in about 350,000 live births per annum. And in developed countries, live birth, babies born following IVF, now school going children, 2 to 3 percent of children um, are IVF babies. And undoubtedly, IVF has made a major contribution um, to reproduction and, you know, in, in terms of helping couples have children who are otherwise not able to have children. By and large, it is safe, um, particularly if you have singleton pregnancies. There are, if we drill down into the science of it, there are some concerns that perhaps because of epigenetic changes of the embryo and the culture medium, um, there may be more adult disease in terms of high blood pressure, obesity, vascular disease. Um, so one still needs to use it judiciously. Um, it does kind of give us new insights into the beginning of life. And I just think that that kind of conversation between children in future is in, entirely plausible. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Steve, and thank you very much, the organizers, uh, for this uh, fabulous opportunity to talk to new friends. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the first time that uh, I'm uh, talking to people in uh, this uh, environment. Um, there are many questions, uh, many deep questions uh, to ask. Uh, first of all, me as an electrical engineer, what am I doing with this kind of uh, topics? Creativity, innovative thinking. Uh, then another question, why do I permit myself uh, to talk about creativity? <laughs> so what uh, distinguishes my thinking that I get the courage to talk about creativity? I don't answer these questions. If you are interested, after, after my presentation, you ask me about why I consider myself being a creative person, as well as why do I have the courage to stand in front of my design students and I believe, and through the responses that I get, change their life to betterment. What a feeling is that? Now I want to talk about this uh, presentation was uh, my presentation as uh, Steve uh, was uh, uh, witnessing, and this was the reason why we got in touch. I use this presentation only in order to address to some of the words. Meta creativity, I have designed this word myself. And I want to talk about the language, about the language for describing self organizing sustained creativity. If you are interested, I happily can provide this material. Now, uh, for uh, this um, session, I have created 
created two uh, instances that I went through myself in order to be authentic. I'm not, I'm not reporting about uh, past experiences. Uh, so yesterday, in fact, I reflected deeply and I uh, thought to myself uh, whether I can make my feelings more tangible. Now, I'm not a psychologist, uh, therefore I cannot address the issues uh, such as consciousness, subconsciousness. I am not a philosopher either. I cannot talk about free will. But happily, I use them. I use these technologies, I use these abilities in my daily work. Now I want to tell you how it happens. First of all, I'm preparing uh, for a, um, a philosophical uh, journal uh, to prove there is, a, there is free will. And this is uh, something that makes me very busy. At the same time, as Steve pointed out, I am writing about uh, hardcore mathematical, mathematical uh, areas. Again, if you are interested, after my talk, ask questions, I will answer about uh, those ideas. Now, free will. Uh, one of the indications that I have the free will and I can manipulate my thinking to the betterment works like that. Subconsciousness, I do not have access to my subconsciousness. Occasionally, good ideas pop up, <laughs> right? So this, these are spikes. And then I say, this, this was my idea. This was, in fact, not my idea. I am the substrate. I am the substrate. This is some, it is like uh, the depths of an ocean. And in fact, what you have access to is the surface of the ocean. We see beautiful space, beautiful fluidity and water molecules and wind, waves, so we can experience that. But we have no access to the depths. And now there are kilometers, miles beneath the surface that I have not any access to. But I know there are many things happening. So this is a one-way, one-way venue. And amazingly, amazingly, and occasionally, Wonderful things happen. And for example, I say now, ultimately, after three decades, and this is one of the things which happened, after three and a half decades, I have a solution for a mathematical problem. After three, and I started 79. 79 was the uh, birth of my uh, youngest uh, kid. <laughs> and it took me that long in order to give a full fledged answer to my question. In fact, 97, I was invited to write a book about that. I said I am not ready. And as it happens, as it happened, yesterday I got another invitation to write a book. This time I said yes, because I am ready. <laughs> now some of the ideas take, take time. Now how happens, how happens, what happens? In our subconsciousness, these are in fact models. These are all models. What we are saying is a model, is a theater, on the stage of thinking and uh, theorizing, these are models. These models may be rejected, may be complemented, may be re-evaluated. These are like every theory. A theory comes from theater. In the mind, in the stage of our mind, so these are things which happen and we observe. Now, I have not any access and control to pick up purposefully, willfully, knowledge from my subconsciousness. This is the way how it is. It may change, but this is the way how, how it is. Now, there is no rigid and fixed demarcation between subconsciousness and consciousness. So, in fact, we do not, we do not know. There is some areas where, for example, daydreaming uh, during our sleep process, maybe there is some uh, gradual, gradual transition to those domains. But what happens is, and what I have access to, is providing my subconsciousness with information. How do you like that? Now, I can provide, provide that me, I have access to my subconsciousness through providing this one way, one way, I can provide information. Now, I have been gone uh, through uh, many uh, people, we, we say they are engineers. engineers. And in my case, these are theoretical physicists, pure physicists, math mathematicians, logicians, philosophers, and so on, in particular in the bracket between 19th and 20th century. 
1880 uh, to 1930, this fabulous time. Again, if you are interested, we can talk about that later. Now, this bracket, this 50 time, was just bringing out of uh, nowhere beautiful ideas, fundamentally beautiful ideas. I studied the creators of those ideas. What happens and what many of these people report is the following fact. Most of these people have two professions. Most of these people have two areas of expertise, even three areas of expertise. Now, if I know that, then I can try to, to supplement my subconsciousness with information. I can provide, now, how are these informations, the information be? I can choose the areas that are significant for building these new ideas. For example, I am an engineer and then by training. But in fact, in the bottom of my heart, I'm a mathematician. And also I have studied physics. I have studied applied physics. And then I have also studied philosophy, psychology. And now I'm uh, putting much emphasis into another area that is the second part of my presentation. I have put on my agenda to find out scientifically and based on scientific rules and means that is my uh, daily activity, I want to study the science of creativity and this is the meta-creativity. This is a language. It's a language in order to describe how creativity happens. And now I give you one or two further examples. I can put information into my subconsciousness. I can enrich my subconsciousness with various ideas. One of the ideas, in fact, I prepared before a huge number of slides in order to show with mathematical tools. But then I thought the uh, audience may not be familiar with mathematical ideas. So I said then, forget about that. But one thing I want to tell you, mathematical formulas are like this in mathematical physics. An operator, which had differential, it, integral, and complex operator, applied to a function that I need to find is equal to zero at the right-hand side. I have to find which function satisfies this criteria. Now, this is for me, uh, zero is equal to something very complex. The left-hand side is an operator is, uh, that I know the properties of. And then the solutions that I need to find such that the left-hand side becomes the right-hand side. Now, the right-hand side is zero. The left-hand side is a complex world. This means that the knowing this idea is nothingness is a lot. Nothingness is a lot. Now, the nothingness, the left-hand side and operator applying to a function is equal to another function. Very often, we have these cases. The right-hand side is given, the operator is given. I have to find a function which satisfies this equation as well. Now, that means the left-hand side is very complex, is equal to another thing. I bring the right-hand side to the left-hand side, and then it becomes an operator, function, minus, is again zero. That means I have found another representation for zero. That means I put, I use this zero, nothingness in my formula, replace this zero with complex ideas that I want. And I use this trick in order to solve complex mathematical problems. Again, if you are interested to go into detail, after my presentation, we can, we can talk about that. So this leads me uh, to some ideas. And, uh, are, and the conclusions are, uh, some of the conclusions are as follows. I purposefully and mindfully and visualizing vividly. So please listen to that, vividly. Vividly, for example, vividly, visualize three-dimensionality in this space. I'm not sure how many of us had realized before the three-dimensionality of this. If you talk to that, many people say, I know this is what are you talking about. This is a three-dimensional space. But after leaving this space, if you see the first tree on your way, realize the three-dimensionality of a three, of a tree and get in touch with this notion of three-dimensionality. You see that somehow you relax for whatever reason, so we have some speculations why. Now, another thing, if you have an apple, vividness of an apple. So please meditate on that. 
and you see why these examples are good, are good because they add to my relaxation. I relax by, by doing, doing that. I relax, I enhance my ability uh, to get in touch with things like vividness. For example, water, HO2, as a molecule, and parallel to that, liquidity. So get in touch with some of the notions which are no longer used. For example, water. But with liquidity is a different, totally different thing. In order to describe liquidity, I need another language. Now, liquidity comes because of the, uh, because of the interaction, complex interaction of millions or billions of entities, some property emerges. So this is emergent phenomenon. And in my view, in my view, this is what happens in uh, the process of creativity. In the process of creativity, uh, one or by definition, by definition, something comes about, something gets created, but this is, in my view, emerges, this emergent phenomena. For example, if you have five water molecules, there is no liquidity. The notion of liquidity comes about because of uh, the interaction of a large number of uh, molecules. And then some new quality emerges. For, exa for example, one person, for one person, the notion of friendship does not exist. Then this is something that we say one plus one is more than two. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why, for example, there are more than one expertise necessary in order to become a creative person. Now, what, what, what then happens? I believe, I believe, if I acquire various, various domains of knowledge, various uh, uh, regions of, uh, uh, in my uh, conscious, conscious awareness, several nested spaces get created. Uh, then metastructures automatically get created. I'm talking about, for example, as soon as I talk about myself and audience, uh, then I see myself from above. That means there is, there is an observer uh, which observes myself. And then I talk about observing myself. This is self-action. Self-action happens even in isolation. But uh, interaction and self-action are two different qualities. Now, talking about these two different qualities, I should go above myself, above the space in which I am observing myself. So these are, these are some of the points that, in fact, it becomes very natural to us if we, if we operate. I want to give you one of uh, my time, uh, two minutes, three minutes. I will be wrapping, wrapping up, and then uh, again, if there are uh, questions, we can uh, address in uh, some uh, greater uh, detail. If I listen to uh, my, uh, my dear previous presenter, many of these ideas that, for example, uh, a molecule or a cell moves, a cell does. So these are descriptions, right? So we, we see. Now let us penetrate into some of the, uh, uh, so trying to explain as uh, scientists, as scientists, try to not to describe, but try to explain that this is a totally different world of uh, evaluating, of uh, judging. As soon as I, I talk about I am, I am observing something happens, and then why this happens. By explaining why this happens, again, I move into a different realm. I become an observer who wants uh, to explain quantitatively in the Western sci scientific uh, manner, I want to measure. I measure, I want to measure some activity, some vibration, some oscillation, some breathing. In order to do that, I need to define a metric. I need to define a space in which this object may be abstract or concrete move, move around. That means the definition of metric means I have to define how I do I measure certain, certain happening, cer certain happen instance. 
by doing that, I have to say, what is my metric? For example, the shortest distance between two points is not always the straight line. The shortest distance between New York and UK is not certain, uh, is because this, this sphere, is, uh, the space, is a, is a geodesic line. Now, this kind of uh, notions become more and more com uh, com complex if I move to more and more abstract areas in order to describe things, describe objects, describe relationships, and describe how to measure. Another important point comes, and which is the last point in my presentation uh, today. Within that bracket of uh, end of uh, 19th, beginning of 20th century, most philosophers, most, most scientists in physics, in mathematics, in logic, they tried, for whatever reason, they tried to show what cannot be done. In fact, not what we can do. What cannot be done? The limits of possibilities. For example, speed of light, the limit of possibilities that we can. Uh, Albert Einstein saying the speed of light is the ultimate uh, velocity. Heisenberg started to say there's a certain uncertainty. If I, there are some conjugate variable, I can measure position, but I cannot measure the uh, dual variable, which is momentum, or time and space. Now, this gives us a very deeper understanding or desire to understand the notion of time, the notion of space, the conjugate variables, which, which are linear momentum, which are energy. So these are some limits on those areas. Provability, Kurt Gödel. In fact, provability by showing that within certain scheme of thinking, within certain intellectual thinking which contains arithmetic, at least arithmetic, there are statements which cannot be proved or disproved. So there are limits. And now, knowing those uh, limits is another, another source for me, another source for creativity. If I know the limits, I want to see how I can uh, find another solution, how I can build another, another way of handling, handling things. Mm -hmm. So I wrap up uh, what I wanted to say here. Just I, I want to remind you of the fact we talk about uh, the subconsciousness and free will. My answer to that is positive. My answer to that is that yes, there is a uh, free will, and yes, I can take control of my creativity. The final point, three physical, physical phenomena, nonlinearity. Again, if there is time, we will talk about nonlinearity, dissipation, and dispersion. They collaborate together in order to build structure, complex structure, which may lead to emergent phenomena, which we say creativity. What was your last point? Too fast. That's last three. Non -linearity. Non -linearity, dissipation. dissipation and dispersion. 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 So, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
systems and training uh, around newborn health. And I managed to convince them to do that and was based here at this hospital and spent my time driving around the western and some, somewhat of the eastern Cape provinces setting up newborn health care. And the reason I came here was because of something called kangaroo care, which was skin-to-skin -skin care, which essentially is a non-technological innovation. I mean, it is technological, but it doesn't contain any technology as we like to think of it. But I want to come back to why Leonardo, the name, and why the 27th of February are important. I mean, so I also, so I came back here first, actually before my first day, I met my wife on those stairs right there, that you all walked <laughs> up coming here. She doesn't remember the meeting point at all, but I remember it very clearly. It took me two months to get her to go out for a coffee with me. Um, and uh, Leonardo is the latest result of that. And the 27th of February is actually quite pertinent because well, firstly, the name Leonardo and the 27th of... So that's obviously Leonardo da Vinci, as many of you know. There's an exhibition on... He was a polymath, um, not unlike Ali Reza. Do you know what a polymath is? And someone who is a scientist, a physician, a mathematician, a philosopher, a psychologist, an astronomer. Pretty much all the things that he, he reeled off. And if you think about kind of the creativity and the genius that was Leonardo was because of the intersection of all these disciplines. And that's why, Steve, I think it's been really exciting to see this course and others like it starting to emerge at the university, just saying, actually, we've gone down a road, especially in, in healthcare, where we've super, super, super specialized. You know, we have the pediatric nephrologist that deals with kind of autoimmune diseases of the left kidney, you know. <laughs> and at some point, we kind of have to take the step back and say, well, that's not going to be the way to actually make the gains that we need to in terms of public health. Um, so I refer to this because kind of for two reasons, I think that this kind of interdisciplinarity of what Leonardo held was, was very important. The other is the 27th of February was the founding date of probably the first university in the world. Uh, 500 years before the word universitas ever came into being. And it was called pan didactiterion. And I have a Greek background, um, and my and Leonardo's great-grandfather is from Paphos. And who was born out of the sea in Paphos? Aphrodite. So it's, she's actually from Cyprus, not from Greece. Um, and pan didactiterion was actually in Constantinople, which was then part of uh, pre-Ottoman Empire. And what it means if you break up the word, pan meaning all, Didacti, meaning didactic, so learning, um, and Terion was a place, right? So it's a place where all learning came, came together. So there were academies, obviously, of all sorts before that, but never before had they been brought together in one place in a kind of cooperate, cooperative environment. It no longer exists. It lasted for over a thousand years. Uh, nowadays, the longest-running university, I think, is the University of Bologna. Um, but it's an interesting history. It was founded on the 27th of February. So what else do we need to kind of think about when we're thinking about creativity and innovation? One big thing is risk. So my risk today was instead of doing a very crisp presentation of 15 slides for 15 minutes, I went surfing. Uh, I'm on paternity leave, so I, I take these chances when I can. Um, and part of the reason I got stuck in traffic on the way here. But the important point is that doing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, a lot around innovation, but it, it's about risk and failure. Um, and we were in a world of healthcare that is very driven by evidence-based medicine. I spent uh, one and a half years at the clinical trials unit in Oxford with Sir Rory Collins, Sir Richard Pito, and Richard Dole, who were the founders of the clinical trial. Richard Dole did the first clinical trial in 1956. So I was schooled in evidence-based medicine. You know, that's just kind of where, where my background was. And kind of came away from it thinking, well, if we have to apply this very rigorous approach to trying new things and thinking that we need to kind of evolve the way we how, how we, how do we do that? How do we wait five years for a clinical trial to do something new? I'm not saying that I'm anything against clinical trials. I'm very strongly driven by evidence-based medicine, but I think we also need other ways of evaluating um, early stage uh, new techniques and developments that I'm going to start sharing with you. So it's about risk and it's also about living on the edge of chaos. Right? So. What's missing in this picture? What, what dimension can, do you not see that, that, that keeps him from falling over? Movement. Movement, exactly. So the speed, right? So this is really performance on the edge of chaos. 
Um, and this really refers to the kind of the system dynamic of, of where we work. Um, and the fact that if we want to work and try and innovate, <laughs> we're working within a dynamic system. So there, there, is a, there is a component of time, the component of context, of currentness, and there's also a component of, of taking risks. And sometimes we're going to touch that corner as we go around, and it's going to end in disaster. Obviously, when dealing with patients' lives, we have to be very cautious and contain and mitigate the risks that we take. These are just some introductory remarks. Given that I'm not talking to MBA students, I'm loving the fact that I can just <laughs> muse about <laughs> certain ideas. <laughs> so thanks for the opportunity, Steve. I'll come back to some standard slides. Um, I run a center for social innovation. Um, it is the first on the African continent, and essentially it's a lens of looking at change. And I'm going to give you some definitions now. Um, it's relatively popular now as a discipline, and in fact it is in itself uh, an interdisciplinary field. It, it draws from plenty from the humanities, from management, from innovation, from the sciences of technology, um, from anthropology, uh, from economics and development. But essentially, why we exist as a center um, and the foundation behind us, the, the birth of foundation, essentially our foundation of a South African family funding activism. And they fund activism in all its forms. And this they see as activism in enterprise, in the economy. Um, and I've called it an art for action and activism. Um, some people in, in the team call ourselves a, a do center, not just a... Uh, a think tank, not just a think tank, but a do tank as well. And so we're involved in quite a few kind of tangible projects where we think they make sense in terms of demonstrating work um, and where we think they make sense in, in influencing policy in addition to, to the research. So as um, Steve said, and I'll come to it at the end, we've uh, one of our key initiatives is really focusing on innovations in health. Um, and what we wanted to do was not to just take what the trend now is in health innovation uh, in the West, which was mostly around high-end technologies and devices and focused on kind of drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, uh, and now technologies. And someone's developed a, you know, an app on your phone that measures your blood pressure. Okay, great. How is that changing the health outcomes of hypertension in South Africa? So it's a lot more than just taking kind of that product and getting it to market. So we really termed our work inclusive health innovation given that we live in one of the most exclusive countries in the world and in the city with the highest Gini coefficient in the world. So we live in an, in an area of extreme inequality. So if we're going to be investing like the corporate sector do, significant amounts of kind of human capital, financial capital, R&D into innovations in healthcare, let's focus it on the needs and the priorities rather than getting products to market. Um, so we really wanted to try and define and frame, and that's what a lot of the summit was about, Oh, is to really understand what do we want health innovation to be you know, f for ourselves in our country and, and hope to start influencing some policy around that. Our work also covers at the center um, uh, innovations in education, another major challenge in our country, um, and again, one that's rapidly changing in terms of pedagogy and curriculum and in how education is actually delivered through schools, through other means, through technology, through financing. Uh, we look at a lot of that. We do quite a bit of work in innovative financing, the space between philanthropy and traditional investment. Um, we're working with National Treasury on some products. I'll talk to you about one in healthcare. Um, we're interested in how innovations become and get integrated and implemented. So I think we've talked a little bit about, you, you raised this idea of receptive uh, towards implantation, right? It's great that we've got this new conception, of, you know, how's it actually going to do anything? Uh, so we're really interested in how things scale, and I'm going to talk a bit about that, and we're really interested in, in policy and the ecosystems around that that allow creative, creativity to be sustained if needed. And a lot of it will fail, but that's okay. That's the world that we, that we work in. Um, so there are about 50 definitions if you look in the papers in, and on, on social innovation. The one we really like the most is, is more than just a novel solution to a social problem, right? And it's more than just a product or a process or a program, but we're really, really interested and we think that social innovations are those that really change the basic routines and the resources, the flows of authority 
and the beliefs in a social system. Because we believe those are, are, are much more likely to be sustained in terms of creating change. The product itself won't do that. So I've talked to you a little bit about my own social uh, innovation journey uh, in health. So it, it, I left this hospital and then probably spent almost 10 years outside of clinical medicine uh, looking at business models and innovations, primarily in healthcare and in all other areas of development and worked from international institutions in Geneva right through to on the ground uh, work. So I like it because it's a useful lens. It happens to be a slightly popular term at the moment, um, but that's okay. Uh, it may be called something else in 10 or 20 or 50 years time. But the point is that it transcends sectors, levels of analysis, and theories of change. And we're really interested in how we dissolve boundaries. So this, this initiative of inclusive health innovation we've done together with the, the, the medical faculty. And it's the first time, as far as I can see, in South Africa, even on the African continent, that a business school is working hand in hand with the, with the health faculty. And that's essentially the kind of work that we believe is necessary. To overcome some of the paradigms of social change. And so this has evolved from our work, and I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor of the kinds of work we're interested in. And often, we all operate when we look at problems and we look at challenges, we operate in this corrective paradigm. How do I fill the gap? How do I meet that need? How do I make sure the drugs get delivered to that uh, clinic? Um, and the much more difficult part, and I think we always default to let's develop the product or the process. You know, let's fill the gap, let's develop a service is really trying to look for transformative change, um, which is really looking at what we call this transformative paradigm. And that's essentially what, for us, social innovation brings. So creativity brings a positive lens towards problems. So what I kind of say often to my students is, why can't we get as excited about how we shape society as we do about kind of how someone designed this mobile phone? I mean, we all, the whole world's super excited about mobile phones. You know, how much billions of dollars and positive energies invested into creating those things. Why can't we do that with the way we shape our societies? All right, so for me, that's the essence of what social innovation is about. And, and these are some of the, the things that we challenge ourselves to think about when we're developing new ideas and, and trying to understand how they might have impact. Right, are we just looking at problems? Or are we, also, are, we are we imagining what possibilities might be? And if we just see a clinic, you know, Putting a clinic in a, in a rural healthcare setting, is that, the, is that healthcare? Does that answer as healthcare? Can we not imagine what might be possible? Right? So for us, it's about just asking some of those questions. You know, all we see in that community is, well, they don't have this, they don't have that, they don't have that. Okay, well, it's kind of draws again from asset-based community development. Well, what do they have? What can we work with? You know, this idea of co-creation, I'll come to that a little bit in the process. You know, development, we think, you know, we're on an economic development curve that is, you know, perhaps linear or somewhat curved. Yeah. Is that true? We just go kind of stepwise and now we become a middle income country and now we become a high income country. Is, is that what we should be aiming for? Can we not evolve into something different? And does South Africa not have the diversity, resources, human capital to do that? You know, what are the patterns? And I mean, this, this, the other bit is, is about institutions. We always complain, I was a doctor working here, it's the system, you know, it's the problem, it's that thing out there. But two-thirds of institutions are carried within ourselves. You know, we carry the institutions. Why are we sitting around the table? Why am I sitting in front? You know, that's, that's kind of an institutional norm of how we teach. Right? So we carry so many of those things with us that are not actually fixed. So we have the ability to move those things. And again, I like to see, you know, when we talk about this, and we've created a master's degree called inclusive innovation to rather see social innovation, technological innovation, commercial innovation on a continuum. So mobile phones again is a great example. Massive commercial industry, billions of dollars, but significant social impact across the continent. Right. Another great example I like to use is um, the One Laptop Per Child project. Does anyone know what the One Laptop Per Child, you might have heard about it. Started almost 20 something years ago, MIT Media Lab to develop a $100 laptop in the days when laptops were kind of 600 to $1,000. As a project which was totally humanitarian and donor funded, it was a failure as a hardware project. You know, we've got $35 tablets coming out of India. Who cares about a $100 laptop, right? 
But what they learnt out of that was a lot of software around how people can become educated and how you can use online technology. But a spin-off of that, which was a totally donor-funded project, was they needed to create low-cost screens that used low energy and worked in the sunlight. So they developed something called e-ink, which became e-readers, which became the Kindle and all those e-readers, a multi-billion dollar industry coming out of a social project. Right, so thinking of kind of commercial innovation, technological innovation, and social innovation as distinct realms is totally false dichotomies. So we've tried more and more to kind of think of what the work we do within this realm of looking at kind of a positive future which is, has kind of economic and social development as something that's integrated. Again, there are incremental, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail on innovations, but essentially there are innovations that are incremental. We build on things day to day and we improve things. And then there are those that are radical and potentially transformative. I'm not going to go into kind of how, the, obviously those are much more rare and disruptive, um, but they can actually, there are switching points where those things become quite interesting. I'm not going to go into too much detail there. A process of innovation and social innovation, which is, you know, the conception piece, which is, you know, where you think about, oh, maybe maybe this is foreplay, I don't know, the prompts, right? The proposals, we maybe uh, we invite out for dinner, the prototypes maybe we try a few times and then actually something happens that's sustained and we're really interested in scale and systemic change. Sorry, that's probably inappropriate. But. <laughs> <coughs> Lots of hormones around at the moment. I wanted to come down now to some actually some tangible ideas and give you some examples of these concepts that I've been talking about. Um, and start one with, you know, I come, I wake up every day and I find myself at a business school. Right? I'm, I'm not a management academic. I'm kind of, I'm, you know, definitely on the, the very left wing aspect of what happens at the business school. Um, but what we're really interested in is we work in a capitalist system. Right? That's our, it's our macroeconomic framework for the world and for South Africa. Um, and it's been actually extremely powerful in lifting many people out of poverty. But they're not perfect, and as I said, we live in this kind of very inequitable world and country. Um, and so the idea of kind of the free markets are perfect systems is a powerful idea in theory, but is, 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 is not real, right? The, the reality is a very inefficient system, and there are things called market failures. Does anyone know what market failures are? Can you give me an example of market failure? Why does milk cost almost 50% more in Kailicha than it does in Central Capital. Right? Why, why are prepaid cell phones so much more expensive than contracts? Why do the poor have to pay more? Right? So this, it's, it's not a perfect system. There are plenty of people who are, are happy to buy milk at 10 rand a litre, not 15 rand a litre. And yet the, the system doesn't work like that. And for all sorts of reasons that you know about, but it's clear it's not a perfect system. Infant mortality, I'm going to use the newborn theme a lot. Um, this is the infant mortality burden. Do you know World Mapper? It's quite a fun tool. It gets to weight by size, the burden, or the, the, the extent of the data that you're using. You can use all sorts of data. This is infant mortality. So obviously, India, West Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, where the major burden of, of diseases. And where are the healthcare workers? <laughs> right. Market's not a perfect system, right? There is a need, there's a demand for healthcare, and there's a supply of healthcare. Clearly, those things don't match. Okay, so we need to be a little bit creative. I've talked a bit about inclusive healthcare innovation. So, essentially, coming back to some of our work, we're really trying to drive the idea that innovations need to take place beyond just technologies, but also in the service delivery, in the system, and in, uh, and in how things get implemented. So, quickly, we're interested in needs-based, empathy-driven innovation, which is for the people, co-created. It's about thinking differently within people. So it's about the people who run systems. It's not just about the products. And then are transformative. And one of the tools we use um, is something called design thinking. This here is World Design Capital in, in Cape Town. And it's around kind of the theme is designed to transform life. So... What does that actually mean and how do we use design thinking in the work that we do and, and, and uh, what, what, we, what we teach? And really, we call this, and this is one of the papers related to what you've got, and I can send that round, which is design thinking for social innovation, which is really taking a creative process and applying it to looking at social challenges. Um, and it's really, for us, what we find it very powerful that it starts with the needs and starts with the users and starts with empathy. So what do people desire? 
what's technically feasible and what's financially viable. So empathize, define the problem, idea around it, prototype, test, and that's the really early stages. There's a quick overview of design thinking. I can send around some, some, some information on this. We've been starting to do some of that work. We had a healthcare hackathon. If there's time, I can show you a video. I'll probably best to just send you the link at Critisco Hospital, which was the first ha hackathon in healthcare in Africa. And um, I was really trying to bridge the gap between uh, healthcare workers and technology developers. And often things are done in isolation and aren't really addressing the needs. So we used this design thinking process for that hackathon. We had 100 people stay 48 hours at Critisco Hospital. Uh, we had 10 teams and the Deputy Director General for Health, National Health, just rocked up because he knew it was happening and saw what was happening. The, uh, the Director for Strategy for Health in the province came and they said every single one of those ideas is relevant to the, the healthcare system. And we've taken three of them and we'll be working with them to v develop their ideas further. And they address everything from basic things like triage to waiting times to uh, patient feedback on experience and quality of care at primary healthcare clinics. So some really interesting ideas that are happening. And I guess for us, it's about um, mobilizing a movement, right? And we said we're action and activists, so we can't do everything. We're not interested in doing everything. We believe that people can be empowered by thinking that they're able to change the system that they're in. So human-centered design really lies at the, at the center of all of this, of human values, technology, and, and viability. So this is the fun stuff, which I'm excited about. And I'm going to give you a few examples. And innovations for me that are interesting are those that find their way to scale. How much time do I have? Am I over? Getting there. It's up to see the, yeah. Three minutes? Yep. Good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll run you through a few. Many of you may know Mothers to Mothers, which was had an office here. I think it was its third site. It now has 1,200 sites uh, across South Africa and a few other countries. What was interesting is it scaled its innovation, which was about mentoring mothers with HIV mentoring other mothers who are recently diagnosed with HIV, you all know, but what's interesting about it is that it really scaled by addressing policy in, in several African countries where the government of Kenya has taken it on across 600 sites. Kangaroo mother care, again, for me it was really interesting where I started. The Cochrane and systematic reviews show that it reduces deaths from prematurity by half. There's no technology involved there. Right? Again, through, public, through a public health program. Uh, this is some work we're doing on something called the Social Impact Bond. Uh, it's a financial innovation um, which really looks at trying to get commercial and private capital to fund preventable aspects, in this case healthcare, in this case malaria, where governments typically can't afford to pay for preventive care. This is the same whether it's prisoner reform, whether it's early childhood development, typically governments and in healthcare, they pay for the bricks and mortar and they pay for the healthcare workers. They don't spend that much on prevention, and yet that will reduce the costs. And, but if they start spend the money on prevention, it doesn't work, they still have to pay for the, the care service. So a social impact bond, in this case, draws money from investors who perhaps might be feeling the pain from maybe loss of productivity of workers in malaria. Um, they, they, they implement a known preventive intervention, and we know we can prevent malaria, bed nets, you know, all, 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 the re all, all the interventions. And if the incidence of malaria is actually reduced and mortality from malaria is reduced, there's a real cost saving to those services. And those cost savings are, are an area which the public sector and the government will, can pay back the investors. So it's actually a financial product, which is for us a financial and a social innovation. Um, that's really looking, uh, in, in this case, to reduce malaria through a totally different mechanism. I'm really giving you a quick flavor of, of everything. Um, mass media communication, Soul City, many people may know. It's a very popular TV program. As, uh, has, I think, about 70% viewership in South Africa. And it was really uh, mass, mass media around preventing, initially, HIV, but really giving public health messages uh, by creating not uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, something that nobody watches, but really edutainment, drama, prime time and very well researched with focus groups uh, and they're an NGO that has 150 million rand a year turnover. Yeah, so they've, they've got a business model behind this and it's, it's really interesting. Um, so for us again an interesting model. 
this is a project that I got involved in developing low-cost medical devices. Uh, again, this was focused on newborn care, a fetal heart rate monitor, and a pulse oximeter. Kind of more straightforward technology project, but started with what's the need? Okay, what's in, in newborn health, what is the major life-saving technology that's needed? Kind of, kind of what are the resources in the context? This is actually wind-up. So it can be used in rural areas, can be used where there is no um, electricity. Um, and actually the major uh, purchaser of these is, is Doctors Without Borders, and they use it in 15 countries. Developed here in South Africa. Again, there are other kind of corporate initiatives which are working in healthcare, a financial product which is innovating around the Medical Schemes Act and using the Occupational Health Care Act. So instead of a 600 rand medical insurance, there's a 200 rand in medical insurance, which gives you unlimited private prim primary care, GPs, optometrists, chronic medication, HIV cover for 200 rand a month. Um, but it uses the Occupational Health Act, not the Medical Schemes Act, which has some, if you kind of know anything about health insurance. So again, they've been creative, they've innovated, they've created a business model around that. So that's it. Um, we've kind of asked the question, how can we reimagine healthcare in Africa together? And we've done that through, started that process through the summit, uh, through the hackathon, I can send around the link. And then I've got a whole bunch of um, publications called the Health Innovators Review, where we went out and looked at who's doing what in South Africa. And it covers service innovation, technology innovation, and a range of things. Sorry, it was a bit over time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.